it's simple, it's easy to build, and it's finally here. My enclosure heater. Hey guys, sorry about the croaky voice, I've got COVID at the moment. Now, I've been holding fire on this video for a while because I wanted to test things thoroughly to make sure that everything worked. And here it is. I know what you're thinking, it's a bit big. It'll never fit inside your 3D printer. But with something as simple as a cardboard box, I got around that problem. But before we begin, let's have a quick recap. Why do we want an enclosure heater? What's the point? Well, most resins typically print best at an ambient temperature of 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. And for an awful lot of us, that doesn't happen consistently. Even Angus from Maker's Muse in sunny Australia noted that even temperatures there drop below ideal in the evenings, resulting in potential print problems. So in a nutshell, if the temperature of our resin is correct, we can expect better printing results. As some of you will know, I've already featured a perfectly capable enclosure heater researched and put together by X3M Snake, which is excellent. But many of you had trouble constructing it. There were a lot of wires that needed to be squeezed into a very small space, and some of you just couldn't manage. So my goal was something larger something easier for us amateurs to put together. If possible, I wanted to make something more economical, something kinder to the environment and easier on the pocket. So I decided to go back to the drawing board and come at things from an old school perspective. The bulb in the box trick is nothing new. Bulbs generate heat and in an enclosed area, this warms up quickly. The trick is to control this process and make it as safe as possible. Here you can see me conducting an initial test. There's a bulb, a heat sensor, a fan and a control unit. It's basic and it's simple. And in approximately 17 minutes, the temperature was raised from 19 to 25 degrees Celsius within a typical printer lid. What's happening is simple. Certain bulbs get hot when they're lit. In this case, I'm using a 25 watt GU10 mains powered halogen bulb. There's a sensor that reads the ambient air temperature, and there's a control box that turns the bulb on and off at critical times according to the desired temperature. The fan has two jobs. It circulates the air within the enclosure, and it bombards the bulb with cool air to stop it from overheating. And in truth, I wasn't sure it would work. I was scared the bulb would overheat and burn its way through the enclosure. So I let it run for an hour, and then for a day, and then continuously for over a week. In that time, absolutely nothing exciting happened, which actually was ideal. The concept worked. But if you're thinking, won't a light bulb hurt the resin? I tested that too. Eight hours later, there was no sign of the resin going off. So how does this fare on economy? With the previous model, it was running a 100 watt heater in a 12 volt circuit, which means the transformer was burning eight or nine amps of power when in use. To put that into context, a typical one kilowatt toaster uses only four amps of power. Now this halogen bulb uses just 25 watts. And in a UK 230 volt circuit, this equates to just 0.1 amps, which, if you like, means it's using 83 times less current. Also, I initially thought, but of course, I was wrong. The maths may have some substance, but I was looking at things too simplistically. Luckily, my buddy Oliver over at Shaping Silver isn't just a talented craftsman. He's also an incredibly intelligent guy who, in addition to speaking several languages, is also an electronic engineer. So I ran my thoughts past him and once he'd stopped laughing at my naivety, 
he tried to explain a complex topic to a thicky layman and pretty much failed. What I gather is that nothing is free. You can't take out what you don't put in. Sure, the first heater ran at 100 watts, but maybe in an hour, it only ran for a few minutes. In that same hour, the bulb running at 25 watts may have run for a full 60 minutes. So what you're saving on one, you're losing on another. And well, I don't think I can make any claims about economy. However, I'd still got a simple, basic and easy to maintain concept. So I set about designing an enclosure to hold the parts securely and safely. Now this took me longer than I'd like to admit, with many alterations and much fettling, until I arrived at a design that supported well and printed first time, every time. This is an STC 1000 mains powered temperature controller, easily and cheaply available on Amazon. It comes supplied with a temperature sensor. This is an 80mm mains powered brushless fan. And if you haven't caught on yet, this is a mains voltage device we're building. So yes, vigilance will be required in construction. The fan comes with these nuts and bolts, which we'll use, and also this metal grill. There's also a useful power cable provided. Obviously, there's the bulb, a mains powered GU10 halogen. I'd strongly recommend not going more than 25 watts, and don't, whatever you do, buy the LED equivalent. LEDs burn much less electricity and don't get hot, which isn't what we want. Actually, I've got a feeling that halogens are being faded out over time in favor of LEDs. So you might want to buy a few spare halogens right now to keep your heater going for a few years. This is a bulb holder and it's the sort that you want. These have ceramic bases to handle the heat that these bulbs can kick out. This is a 15 amp terminal block and we don't need anything like 15 amps. But the terminals on these controllers are tiny and many of you complained about this with the last heater. So a nice large terminal block makes it easier to fit our wires. Our American and Canadian cousins must love things even bigger as I could only find 20 amp versions on their Amazon stores, but they will work fine. This I haven't mentioned until now. It's a thermostatic switch. In essence, it allows electricity to pass through it until the ambient temperature goes past a specific level. In this case, 45 degrees Celsius. It's a simple, cheap, but effective extra level of safety that I've decided to include. Wires was something that people worried about with the last heater. What sort should you use? What color? What gauge? So again, I'm going to make this simple. Just grab an old unwanted mains power cord, the sort that might be on an old electrical appliance. Strip away the outer coating and you'll likely have two or three wires inside. Here in the UK, these are typically blue, brown and green, though I have seen white and black and even red and black. And this bit is important. The color really doesn't matter. The color is just an outer sleeve that insulates strands of a conductive metal within. Now we need four wires and it's generally not good practice to use an earth cable, despite everything that I've just said. However, using a little insulation tape, we can mark both ends of two more cables, giving us four differently identifiable wires. Just make sure that you know which wire is which. As for length, about eight inches or 20 centimeters is fine. Also, the internet tells me. You're also going to need some nuts, bolts and washers. In the description is a shopping list 
and I've recommended buying some kits that contain a variety of fixings, just for easy shopping. But here's the exact number and sizes of the fittings that I used if you want to shop more frugally. Do make sure that you stick with M4 sizes. I designed the enclosure to lovingly and delicately handle the nuts of this size making assembly without a spanner possible a lot of the time. I designed the enclosure to be small enough to print on the vast majority of resin printers. I wouldn't recommend FDM printing as I've been very precise here. Plus PLA might not be as good with heat as resin. It's a modular design to make assembly easy. Now you can design and make your own enclosure if you're so inclined. It's a fun project and you may find it less time consuming than I did. But personally, I'm selling the STL files for this project cheaply on my Etsy store. I'm only asking for a tenner and for all the work I put in guys, it's not too much to ask. But if you do think it's too much, well, tough sh I've included both supported and unsupported files because, as I've said before, I tend to overdo supports. So you may want to do your own, but my supported files should print first time, every time, though you will need to spend 5 to 10 minutes or so per print clipping away those supports. Now you've been warned, so no complaining. Just make sure you sand away all those nubs and tiny leftovers. Now, by sheer coincidence, Eligu sent me a bottle of their thermochromic resin. Actually, it's quite nice to print with, and it's the sort of stuff that when heated to 50 degrees Celsius or hotter, changes colour. Well, it struck me that this could be a nice safety feature. So I've printed my entire enclosure in thermochromic resin. And if I ever see it change from grey to purple, I'll know that something has gone very wrong and it needs to be turned off. So far it hasn't done it, there's absolutely no reason why it should, but better safe than sorry. It doesn't matter where we start, but let's begin with the heater box. You can't miss it, it has a dirty big vog on the front. The hole at the bottom is shaped perfectly to the bulb holder. Just align and push firmly. You'll feel it become snug. No glue or fixings are necessary. The fan has two black wires, as it doesn't matter which is which. But to make things easier for you guys, I suggest marking one with a bit of tape. There's a little arrow on the side of the fan which needs to point upwards. And take note of the orientation of everything here. There's a small hole in the fan box these wires should push through easily. Use the four nuts and bolts that came with the fan to secure it in place. Don't over tighten, it's only resin and can break. Now these nuts haven't come loose for me yet, but you may prefer to use locking nylon nuts. That's completely down to you. The heater box goes on top of the fan box. You'll see a hole at the back through which the cable from the heater box can pass. Oh, and again, the bulb holder has the same coloured wires, so I marked one with tape. This will all make sense soon. Use the M4 bolts to join the two modules together. The cable from the heater box is fed through the knobbly thing below, which is a technical term that I've just invented. The STC controller has these orange brackets which secure it. Just press and pull to remove these. There's also this little cover that we need to remove, exposing the terminals inside. We need to do a bit of wiring before moving on. So let me do an obvious safety message. Electricity can harm and even kill you, especially mains voltage, so don't get it wrong. Make sure there's no power connected whilst you're building this device and proceed cautiously. Get professional help if you need it. You're doing this at your own risk guys, so please be careful. Note the numbers that are marked on the STC controller. We're going to insert our designated live wire into number 1 
and the neutral into number 2. Terminals 5 and 6 are for the heater, which for us is a bulb. So I've made use of my marked wires here. Terminals 3 and 4 are for the probe, the temperature sensor. Both wires are black, so I've marked one with tape. The orange fixings from the controller just push in place. The orientation of the STC box is critical. Make sure that this knobbly bit is at the bottom. The STC controller should now slide into the opening and you'll actually feel it ratchet into place. The STC box sits beneath the other two assembled modules. Feed the wires from the sensor below the controller and then out beneath it. Then join the modules. Again, feed the wires through the knobbly bit. Now comes the pig. The junction box is small and innocent looking, but it's where we squeeze in all the wires. Let me introduce you to the bit that will terrify some of you, the wiring diagram. Now believe me, it looks complex, but it's really quite simple. If you were wondering why I was marking all those wires that don't really need marking, this was why. To make identification easier and to allow you guys to follow a simple step-by-step -step guide. So let's give things some names. On the fan, the plain black wire is F1. On the marked wire, it's F2. On the bulb, the white wire is B1 and the marked wire is B2. On the sensor, the plain wire is P1 and the marked wire is P2. And on the thermostatic switch, you can decide for yourselves. But one will be SW1 and the other will be SW2. Cut off four terminals from your terminal block. This is just going to rest at the bottom of the junction box. Now we're going to mentally label these T1 to T4. With that done, you're now in a position to follow the steps on the diagram. Just take it one at a time. Insert the appropriate wires into the appropriate terminals. The junction box has a clamp base built into the bottom and a separately printable top. Using a couple of 20mm M4 bolts, combine these, leaving them slack for the moment. The fan came with a power cable, and if yours is like mine, one wire is white and one is black. Insert this through the junction box, beneath the clamp, and then tighten to grip firmly. With this done, you're now in a position to follow the steps on the diagram. So let's get started. Step 1. The white wire is live, so insert this into T1. Step 2. The black or neutral wire goes into terminal 3. Yes, that's 3, not 2. Follow the steps correctly. Step 3 and Step 4. Connecting the sensor P1 and P2 to STC3 and STC4 is something you've already done when you added wires to the controller. Step 5. The thermostatic switch SW1 connects to T1. And Step 6. SW2 connects to T2, giving us our safety feature. And honestly, that's as far as I can take you. I wanted to go step by step, but it just became a tangle of wires and fingers. So just take your time and follow the steps on the diagram. When it says anything relating to the controller, like STC1 to T2, remember these are the wires you've already attached to the controller. So STC1 for me had a brown wire, STC2 had a blue, and so on. Honestly, this is the best step-by-step -step guide I could come up with. And whilst you'll get fed up screwing and unscrewing the same terminals, it will work. Eventually, you'll be able to squeeze everything inside the junction box and bolt the modules together. Now the bulb can be inserted. The metal grill is added to the upper cover, which is then bolted home. The probe has room to slide through the knobbly bits, 
and it even has a support of its own. You can leave your sensor loose if you wish, but I like neatness. The only problem is that it needs to be a tight fit, so a little sanding here may be needed to allow the probe to insert snugly. And if your wiring was done correctly, plugging your enclosure into the mains should now bring it to life. Programming the controller is relatively simple. When it's first turned on, leave it for two or three minutes whilst it sorts itself out. After that, we need to access the functions menu, of which we need only three functions. Press and hold S until F1 appears. This is our goal temperature. Press and hold S again. Personally, I went with 26.5 degrees, but you can use the up and down arrows to select your choice. Release S and use the arrow button to scroll to F2. Press and hold S again. This is the return difference. I've chosen 0.5 degrees. So when the ambient temperature falls 0.5 degrees or lower than my goal temperature, the heater will click on. Again, using the arrows will allow you to select your preferred difference. Release S and use the arrow button to scroll to F4. Press and hold S again. If your temperature probe shows a different temperature to that on an ordinary household thermometer, you can calibrate the programmer by adding or subtracting the difference using the arrow buttons. Finally, click the power button once or do nothing for several seconds for the program menu to exit. As I said right at the beginning, you'll need an enclosure to house both your printer and heater. And I used this cardboard box as it's big enough even for the Elegoo Saturn II and my heater. Now, I don't think cardboard is ideal and I would not recommend this. If DIY is your approach, personally, I'd recommend something like MDF, making sure you have at least one inch or 25 millimeters clearance all the way around both the heater and the printer. For my preference, I've turned to Wambam Systems and I'm awaiting delivery of their hot box. This is a beautifully constructed, collapsible enclosure designed for FDM printers, but it will work perfectly for our needs here. The only slight drawback is the clear front cover, but I've got a few ideas in mind for that already. Now, it would be wrong of me not to tell you that Wambam Systems has recently released a hot box designed for resin printers. To me, it looks excellent, though it does rely on trapping the printer's own heat and that caused by the catalytic reaction of the curing resin to warm the enclosure. That's not a process that I've had any luck with, which is why I've turned to a heater. And this particular enclosure is too small for my needs, but maybe it's a path that you'd prefer to tread. I'm waiting for my hotbox to arrive. With its insulated and even fire resistant properties, it's the one I'd recommend. But I'll leave these choices up to you. So finally, does it work? Of course it does. In my temporary cardboard box, it takes about an hour to get everything up to temperature. But after that, the heater ticks away gently, maintaining a temperature with nothing but a simple bulb. It's never become too hot to touch, never turned purple, and it's always done what I wanted it to do. Even though these bulbs live for a few thousand hours of use, replacing them is cheap and easy. So I'm looking forward to many hours of temperate printing. So that's it for this one, guys. Look in the video description for links to diagram downloads and suggested parts lists. Follow the guidelines safely and you'll have a warm and cozy printer of your own. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to drop me a line. So take care guys, and thanks for watching.